All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, Tuesday, March 20th meeting of the OSC dev team. Welcome. Um, working document. Ah. Okay. Current meeting is where the working document is, so I'll, I'll start and uh, <clears throat> update everybody. So things are going well. Um, Let's see, new people on a team. We're, we're actually getting a few good new people on a team that are going to be joining. There's, um, so Bhakti is, is on the team now working on the Aquapana Greenhouse uh, part library for FreeCAD. Some crazy stuff there. There's another person, Katie, who's applying and, and um, maybe some other people uh, in a pipeline. So looking to increase that number of hours of the total development effort over time which i think we're going to do a major spike and if not yet there's towards the the later part of the year as we get really going and everything but in the meantime uh, i'll update everybody on the biodigester so this is where we are right now uh, this is actually the toilet maceration pump that's the work happening right now uh, the the biodigester is starting to work and we're connecting the toilet here. What we had to do is rip out this massive hole. Um, let me share my screen uh, so you can watch where I'm pointing to. Yeah, this is the macerator pump. This is uh, the check valve. This is that this black pipe goes to the biodigester. Uh, the toilet is up right here. Uh, the valve here selects between. Uh, it's it's a selector valve for between. I won't talk about that, but here what we had to do is rip out this hole here. It's kind of, we kind of had to hack it. The toilet was not flushing properly without an air vent. So, so since then I've connected the air vent from this to the drain, to basically to the vent stack. I'll, I'll show more pictures about this later. That's just a quick picture here. But yeah, we're getting ready to test this. Uh, it's a system where um, it's a, actually a separating toilet without modifying the toilet so what happens there is the sods get pumped through the macerator pump but if someone just takes a leak for urine we have this passive flow this white pipe here that leaks everything down into the septic fertigation system down the drain uh, so you don't need to to activate the the macerator pump to load the digester upon urination uh, the idea there is that you don't want urine inside the biodigester so we send that down the river here, uh, down into septic fertigation. So only the sods get pumped into the the digester. Okay, that's that. A little bit of work on a PVC frame D3D. So so idea here is on a PVC frame that um, the idea is it's a low cost, very easy entry, easy entry way to get involved with D3D, and that's why we promote that. The official, you can say somewhat the official version is is the metal, which is stronger, but the plastic does make a lot of sense. We'll get into a little bit more like this. This is what Steven did in California, uh, but here's a new proposed jig. I asked him to see if he could uh, cat up this new jig that I described here. Essentially a jig that would align against the corner piece and have the two holes in it so you don't have to measure. It's self-aligning and then it gets you a, a perfect... Uh, hole through what he did was um, more complicated it's an official like a drilling jig but you have to do all this setup work as in the upper right hand corner picture you can click on a wiki if you want to get more details on this jig but um, let's see if steven does that a uh, little more on my side so this weekend actually we're going to the midwest Re midwest rep rap festival that's in in indiana we're going to drive out there. It's a, reportedly the biggest rep wrap or 3D printer event in the world. Happens to be next this weekend. Uh, one more little item that I have here. Um, so currently we're planning on... I'm actually going to show the critical path for a second here. But we are planning currently to go, go to Utah uh, in... This is November. And we still have to work out all the details there. But we're going to do a CD eco home there with CB walls. So that's like a major step up. Uh, that's kind of like the advanced version of the CD eco home. Right now, the CD eco home is framed, primarily framed uh, for the modular construction. But we're going to 
do this with bricks and we know that we can do it it's a question of getting the workflows proper and getting the based on all the learnings from we had eight different CB builds on site so learning from all of that we are pretty confident that we can do a big house now in a five it's gonna be actually a six-day workshop but the way this uh, earthquake construction works is you can do rebar through the the CEBs but that's not what we're gonna do the 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 better way according to Jim Halleck who Halleck who does earth construction like this with CBs uh, is to use the basket technique so basically you have the CB wall one foot thick and you have mesh just standard um, there's there's metal mesh like you do for stucco or you could use um, a mesh that's actually basalt fiber it's it's a mesh that's made of ba the rock basalt that's been turned into fibers and it's actually stronger than rebar uh, so we can use those one of those two choices use either regular mesh or basalt mesh for the wall but basically you wrap the two, two sides of the wall in a mesh and then you do cross ties through the wall so as you're building the wall up you put in metal ties just metal wire uh, that is strong enough that, that you tie the mesh to later on when you put the mesh on so this is like this this it's called a double it's a basket call it like double basket construction where this is used for earth earthquake stabilization so that's um, that's what we're going to be planning on doing okay let's get to some other people here do we have John on the call here let's see oh yeah hold on no hold on a sec I do want to go over just a couple of notes on a critical path because we're really getting down to posting everything I'm trying hard to get that all posted by April the 1st uh, but there's a lot of lot of different things the things we know we're doing right now is we're gonna have a June early June aquaponics workshop here and a PV workshop where we install a PV system a workshop in Eugene on a 3d printer that's in June 21st or June yeah something like that um, July or August we're gonna do the CNC circuit mill workshop and from from the workshop in June on the 3d printer we want to try to do one every single month so I'm thinking 3d printer we want to do the filament maker again unfortunately the Thunderhead filament maker from the tech for trade people just didn't materialize uh, no documentation uh, forthcoming from the group as as of today so we're gonna have to move on to what we did before and i'm actually going to visit hugh lyman um he lives in, by seattle so on my way out to eugene i'm going to stop over at his place just to check him out but the idea there is uh the production for the lyman filament maker is is a pound per hour it can go uh so basically two hours to get yourself a two pound spool of filament if you talk about two hours in a single day you could make 12 rolls of filament not too shabby I mean that's that's acceptable like if we had to do production where we actually do do filament for sale that's doable especially if you think of having several of these Lyman filament makers operating in parallel so that could be could be a good thing um, sufficient to do production for real use and possibly for sale uh, we're still looking for uh, one location for August for the 3d printer workshop and this is this is all open I, i'd like to bring it to a city big city somewhere or possibly people like lex how about uh in new hampshire or something but we don't have a set program we want to do one at factory farm here either july or august but then the other one we want to take on the road somewhere uh, le then leading up to the osc immersion program in september uh, we're looking at getting the first cd home turn tour up in july i looked at um what's it called the, the like the 360 degree viewing like augmented reality thing where you kind of do a virtual walkthrough there's open source software for that so we will try to get a an open source 3d walkthrough of the cd go home uh, going for the the cd go home tour tours for the aquaponics where we'd like to see if we could get the uh the workbench for aquaponic greenhouse design we have all the modules in excruciating detail within sweet home 3d so it's a porting job uh, we have all the details for the aquaponics so that's good that we can readily translate that into freecad 
uh, as a workbench, just like we're doing with the 3D printer. So that's kind of like the latest on the schedule. Um, yeah, get, let's get the PVC 3D printer out there because that's going to that's gonna be what's going to be used in a Eugene workshop. So we have to get that up and, and all tested. That's a basic, basic state of where we are. And, and the idea is after the immersion in September, just start running 3D printer workshops all over the place. So the people that graduate would be able to run those workshops and we'd like to contract with our graduates <coughs> to, to run to collaborate with us for future workshops um, that's that's the point to actually get regular workshops as a way to fund the OSC development where people can actually start doing that as as their livelihood and the metric for the immersion program right now is I'm thinking okay if we can explicitly say okay as a result of this you're gonna be able to go say 50% off into open source product development because the 3d printer workshops are gonna pay for you that's the kind of mental model on that because we need to have people supported by the open development work in order to make a living okay let's now i i pass it on to to john are you on the call yes john can you continue on where you are what your trouble spots are how far you got so far so maybe we can help you get going yeah john can you can you speak oh. Yeah, I'm we just can start work in the bathroom. Ah. In the back, I'm in the uh, office. Okay, okay. So maybe uh, we'll just look at what you've got for your your update. Okay. Um, how's it uh, going with uh, using this? So the latest was using the simplified modules in the CAD and getting a meaningful model. How far are you on that? Uh, is that coming along? You want to chat in the box or 95% going well? All right. Um, let's see. Uh, let me see if I could pull that off John's log that is worthwhile to look at. Um, we call it D3D Ohio version 18.02, which stands for February of 2018. And um, yeah, let's see, do we have this? Work in progress right here. Let's see, we can take a look at that. Uh, totally rendered, simple version with basic parts. So yeah, we can take a look at that. Um, okay. Let's see what else. Uh, 3D printed parts. So Steven's helping out with 3D printed parts for a frame. I was thinking about the frame for the D3D, and it's it's pretty realistic. If we want to get super stiff frames, I was thinking if we fill them with concrete, that could be pretty powerful. For example, take a look at two-inch pipe. Put a piece of rebar in there with spacers and fill it with concrete. How strong is that going to be? That might even be enough definitely for light duty routing and possibly for some heavier duty CNC. So I'm actually thinking about if we could print, yeah, print, print or use PVC pipe. The PVC slash rebar slash concrete, that's as strong as it gets. Space frames like that? Possibly. So we'll, we could explore that as iterations of the the plastic frame which we we know like by itself it's not going to be as strong as steel but we can reinforce it with concrete and even rebar for larger versions that's that's pretty interesting what we could do is we can drill a simple hole in one corner and a, a hole in a far opposite corner and fill it with slurry like using something like a turkey baster or some kind of a little syringe pump that pumps into a small hole drilled in one of the corners like say a half inch hole in one of the corners we just fill that thing full of maybe you could even even do like plaster of paris or just concrete mix or mortar mix uh, that would be interesting so that's that's just something to think about uh, what else um, thoughts on merging timing timing belts how will i fuse these after cutting to proper length yeah no we don't have to worry about it. we've got that nailed the the belt clamp that we have in the the piece in the middle piece 
we figured that out uh, if you I don't know where that is on the wiki but the belt no we have we actually have a good video on that too uh, d3d belt um, actually Shane working on a CNC circuit mill he actually made a video detailed video now look at that d3d belt tensioning um, so yeah we have a yeah we actually have another video if you look at uh, d3d belt tensioning there's a video at it says at minute 38 and then I know that Shane also made a video on that so we should add that video to the d3d belt tensioning page but there's a pretty slick mechanism that we have that's pretty foolproof and it uh, it's very easy uh, you have to understand how it works but if you know how it works it, it's actually very easy to tension the belt and it doesn't use like clamps or screws it's just a peg it's a it's a holding peg that that makes it all work it's you'll like it it's it's pretty good okay um, okay well let's move on to so after John, John we move on to Lex tell us about your experience with the Prusa i3 MK3 how is that going um, so I've, I've only printed a few things with, can you hear me yeah I can hear it uh, I've only printed a few things uh, one of them Sorry guys, I messed up there. Uh, sorry, uh, Lex, can you go again? So you printed some, some things. Like part count and unique part count and construction. This thing is freaking complicated. You need it to be like a rocket scientist. Oh to yeah. Together. I don't even know how many unique parts there are. It's got to be at least a hundred. Yeah. And and it's really annoying because like there's not uh, there's a lot of places where things could have been like. Uh, parallel where it's like the same no matter how you put it in you know yeah and and they chose to not do that and i don't wow. know why but if, if things were more of the same like it, it would have been harder to screw things up yeah uh and I, so I don't and there's other things where you can sort of tell that like uh they had a design that worked and then they just kept iter iterating on it but didn't like go back and refactor the larger piece and so one or two pieces will just get really really complicated and then there's parts in that piece to make up for the fact that they don't want to change other things. Oh, wow. So, yeah. I mean, I guess and that's true with, with anything. I mean, like in software, the same thing happens where you just keep adding stuff on instead of going back and kind of refactoring, you know? Yeah. Um, so, and I think a lot of the complexity is because of that. This is, you know, version 3, and they've iterated on it so many times that uh, it makes, at this point, I think starting from scratch, but like if those people who made this one with everything they know and all their experience, if they started from scratch, they could probably build something way better. Yeah. Uh, than continual iteration. Yeah. Uh, other than that, I mean, it took me two days basically to assemble it. Uh -huh. uh, and it, and it worked out of the box. I mean, it's got the uh, the, the intelligent uh, uh, software that like does all the calibration and stuff. So once it's done with the calibration, it's pretty much ready to print, and it, and it'll compensate for any issues or. Uh, but my my bed is pretty flat, so that was that was a good thing. Yeah. So I didn't have too many issues. It just, it, but but it, it takes like 15 minutes to calibrate. Um, 15 minutes? I don't know if that, yeah, I don't know if that's a Prusa only thing. Yeah, because the bed has some magnets in it or some kind of sensor. And so when it calibrates, it's a nine point calibration. And it, like, it goes over each spot in every different direction. So it actually measures, uh, uh, like after you, you go over a spot a whole bunch of times, it measures the, if, uh, the accuracy, like accuracy loss over time. Uh -huh. Back and forth. So, like, if there's slop, I guess it detects slop in the going back and forth, and it does that on all nine points. Yeah. Uh, so it does take a while, but then I guess from that point on, it, it it knows how to compensate at all of the different spots. And that happens once per every time you turn a printer on. Um, no, it happens once, just period. Like after you build it, you do this the 15 minute one. Okay. And then after that. After that, what it does is before every print, it does a nine-point calibration that's just fast. And in that one, it, it just goes to every point and makes sure that each point is still within a distance uh, that it measured originally, like in the initial calibration. And that takes maybe 30 seconds or less. Uh, but one interesting thing is it'll actually detect if you have like a filament or some kind of dirt that's stuck under the, the sheet, the bed sheet that comes off. Uh, it'll actually detect that your sheet is warped from what it was originally. 
because that's one of the reasons they have you do the original one that takes 15 minutes and then do quick ones afterwards is they'll actually detect if something happened between not between the original calibration and the you know and what it is right this minute oh wow so, so in other words like if there's a piece of uh if there's a print still on a bed or some some piece of slop no like like if you took the the uh the print bed off so like it, there's like the, the you know, sheets the steel sheet right and when you put it on something accidentally fell under it like some i don't know okay uh, a sheet of uh, a piece of plastic or something okay i see so you have a little a little warped section in the, in the thing and they will actually detect that and they show it in the video how that that's detected um yeah cool. yeah very nice so, yeah, so it's not just yeah it does a, a 3d map of the um of the bed yeah and then if that changes from what it was originally it will tell you that something's something wrong yeah yeah joseph prusa is supposed to be at this midwest rep rap festival so it'd be good to meet him and ask him why he doesn't publish the blueprints anymore <laughs> yeah well the blueprints are out just not the part ones. wait the the blueprints the no i mean the cad file Yeah, aren't the cat files available? Uh, for the latest version? Well, I don't know if the latest version. I'm not sure the latest version. I I know the. I know the former versions we could get. Get, uh, the blueprints, the actual CAD. I don't think when we looked for this one, I don't think we found the the latest, CAD. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, and you yeah, did. I don't know. No. It's just it's so complicated. Um, like I don't know. I don't think it's worth it. I yeah. Think, I think it, we should just do our own thing because the parts there's nothing interchangeable. Like every single part is unique, more or less. Wow. And it uses so many screws. Like what you see there. So on that on that slide you're on on the right hand side is the the, the entire print head, right? Yeah. There's probably uh, I don't know 30 uh, 30 bolts and nuts in, in that in that uh, thing. And and a lot of these I think could be just one piece. Yeah. Uh, having everything all as, as separate pieces. Yeah. And you can probably use like plastic clips and stuff instead of um, instead of all those uh, nuts and screws. Yeah, yeah. I was just looking at um, according to our BOM for the D3D, our unique part is uh, I don't know how you you could probably say 34. The other stuff is like heat shrink, solder, Kapton tape. So we're in a 30s, or or you can say. Th the line items in our bill of materials is 39, so so you can say 39 part count. Yeah, I mean we're proud of the simplicity because that's that's what allows you to do the modularity and ease of uh, modification. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting. That's good. Are you happy with uh, it's how it works? Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's pretty cool. Uh, one other thing I'll add is you know, like so you you build it yourself, right? And supposedly because you build it yourself, you can like fix parts on it. But the problem is they made it so complicated and, and everything sort of uh, builds on top of it itself or on top of like you, you uh, like the, the wires that you pass through and stuff that if you were to try and change it later, uh, like replace it, like for example, the... Lex? Yep. You there? Um, I, I'm sorry. I, I clicked on a, on a link in the chat box and it goes into the same. Oh, okay. It goes into so, the yeah, same I window. Saw, I was saying, the, like the, uh, for example, the height sensor, right? Yeah. Like, let's say the height sensor is bad and you have to replace it. Oh my God. You would basically have to take the whole printer apart and, and like reassemble it just to replace the. Because the cable, like if you, if you open up back on the slides on the right side, yeah. Um, where that, that sensor, so the cable goes inside of the, the box. Oh, wow. And so if you have to replace the uh, that sensor, right, yeah, so the gray cable, right, it goes out yeah. and then in and it goes inside. And then it comes out through this uh, black uh, black uh, cable yeah. packet. So if you were to replace that sensor, you have to, like, rip, you have to take off the back part. You have to, uh, there's, like, several plates on the back that you have to take off. You have to basically cut all of the zip dies. You have to remove 
um, that black uh, hose type thing on it. Then there's a whole bunch of other things on the bottom of the printer that you have to uh, take off and, and remove. Yeah. To replace the one wire. So it's, it's huh. a huge pain. I mean, wow. It looks nice, right? Because they, they packaged everything so you don't see the wires. But replacing stuff is, is, is going to be a, you know, a real pain in the butt. Yeah, very interesting. So they don't prioritize the design for serviceability. That's one of our very high points because we know that it's really about the lifetime of a machine. It's like how easy is it to maintain and, and service if, if we're talking about lifetime design principles. Yeah, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so this is, uh, you got some examples of print quality? Yeah, and it prints pretty well. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, as long as the print doesn't fail. When the print fails, then obviously it sucks. But when the print doesn't fail, it's it's pretty good. What are? I was pretty impressed with it. Did you have prints fail? Like for what reason? The, the only reason so far is if, uh, like, if you print something really small, sometimes it'll it'll detach from the board, and then because uh, the, these are like uh, sheet plates and they're supposed to be easy to take stuff off of them. Yeah. And so sometimes the, the print nozzle will knock over uh, the piece if it's really small. And then once the piece is off the bed, then you pretty much screw it. Um, so, so far, that's been my only failure, is when the, the, the piece you're printing gets disconnected from the bed. Now, why would the... So you're saying the probe is so near that it sometimes hits the print? No, not, not the probe. I think it's the nozzle. The nozzle. Okay. Yeah. And actually, that reminded me, there's a point on later slides, I think, uh, Ruslan's slide, where uh, you ask, uh, what's the advantage of a large print bed, and that the fact that you can print more than one thing. I actually think not with my, you know, it was just my little experience with, with the printer. It's actually a bad idea to try and print a whole bunch of stuff on an order, because if any of them gets knocked over, it's going to knock everything else over, and you pretty much lost the whole print. So I think efficiency-wise, it's actually better to have a whole bunch of little printers and have each one printing one part than to have one large printer uh, printing because then the failures don't, you know, they're not compounding errors. Right. The counter-argument to that is if you have a very fat print head like the 1.2 Volcano nozzle, 1.2 millimeters, then you do want the big space. Uh, your point about <laughs> the whole print getting messed up, yes, there's higher risk. You can also do, if you have... Because I was thinking about that, if you do have really big production prints, you can set up the, the logic on the print to print one thing at a time. So it finishes one thing and then moves on to the next thing. So that's a way yeah, to prevent it from uh, yeah doing the whole catastrophic failure. Yeah. yeah one thing at a time is fine. I just, I just meant if you print, you know, because in, in, in Slicer you can have multiple of the same thing. So that's what I mean is like if you try and use the entire print bed to speed up your print, and you have like five of the same thing printing at the same time, and then you, one of them gets knocked over, you're pretty much screwed. Yeah. Up all five well, I mean, I can tell you that production D3D printing, I mean, we've had this thing with like, I had like up to, I don't know, maybe 12 of the same carriages printed vertically. I mean, that's how you can print something in like a day or two versus having to do a print in many many days because every time you start up you have to catch it that oh it just finished and then you have to restart it again so from the production standpoint if we assume that we're we're you know we're enabling production as well it is very important to have the multiple prints and that's that's in fact how i print you know to print out 12 kits uh that still takes a week or two when you're doing like 12 parts at a time. So imagine if you have, you know, like a couple of parts at a time, you just have to do so much more maintenance of it. So it is very important to have that foolproof mass printing capacity in a vertical direction. And that's the reason why we don't have a moving bed. The Prusa has a moving bed, so you cannot print things as well vertically because the bed moves around and it would knock them off more easy. In fact, when we tried to print the experience from last year or a couple of years ago, printing the the, the tractor tubing, we print that vertically, and on a, on a low spot, you can't print that more than about four or five inches before it starts wobbling and the print gets really crappy. So, for us, I mean, we want to do uh, 
if we do a little scale model prototype, you want to have the longer tubing to accommodate for prototypes, the, just the scale model prototypes. So, so for us, the stationary bed is very important. That's, I mean, that's, you can say the, the non-stationary bed, I mean, that's not, not professional level, that's, that's more the hobby style printer. But if you want the stability upon vertical, big vertical objects, you really need a stationary bed. And that's part of the design of D3D is, is why we have the stationary bed. Um, okay. Um, what are your next steps? Uh, I don't know yet. Print some more things, I guess. Kind of get a feel for it. I haven't printed anything more than like half an, that prints half an hour. So. Okay. Uh, I'm a little scared now that I've had so many failures. Or I guess less than half of them are failed. But uh, I don't know if it's something, if I need to calibrate some more. Or I think it might just be a slicer issue. I need to be better about how I slice things. Hmm. And I'm using the Prusa slicer, but uh, I don't know if it, if it compensates for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know. What is the failure? What is the normal failure rate on these? Things? Well, I mean, is there a number that it's supposed to be you could, that you can print for, you know. Uh, I, I kept a record of, of my prints, and wh when I got going, I had, I don't know, like, I mean, I would go for days without any failures, and then then there might be some snag, like something was actually wrong, and and then I had to fix it. But no, I mean, you're supposed to have like, for production, you want to be like, 99 percent, at least. Um, okay, yeah, I'm not there yet. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if this printer will ever get to that point, but at least I have something I can print with now. That was the main thing. Yeah. So if I can do something better using it, that's that's all I care about. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can think of just a comment about printing a whole bunch of parts. It's good, like, once the printer is working well, then printing a, a large amount of parts is really nice because then you have all of those that succeeded. So you're kind of multiplying your success rate when you have a well-working printer with printing many parts. Yep. Okay, let's get next to the D3D workbench in FreeCAD because the idea would be uh, Lex, if you can uh, get on a bandwagon of the PVC uh, D3D, I mean, is that what you were thinking, d doing a PVC version? Yeah, I am definitely interested in the PVC stuff. Even for the, for the stuff I was experimenting with before, with just uh, uh, kind of like an all-3D print, all printed version, and also using the, uh, the uh, pulley access system where you're not lugging around uh, one of the motors. Uh, I, think, I don't know if you remember what I was talking about before, but... Uh, yeah, I would like to try that. I think because I think the, the, the D3D is kind of very similar to all of the other existing printers. Um, and uh, I don't know, I, I, I'll, I'll build one just to kind of, just to make sure that I can go in and replicate more of them. But I think I'm still more interested in something that's different because if we're going to advertise OSC as having uh, kind of, you know, as having something that we've designed and built that's unique and that, that actually... Um, is better than than the other things out there. Like I think that's that's good for the OSC brand. Um, so, and, and also, it, I don't know. It just it just makes sense to me to have something that uses less uh, like nuts and, and bolts. Because the current the current D3D printer uses still quite a bit. I mean, just making those uh, sandwiched uh, pieces, it uses you know, four four bolts. Well, uh, the challenge is do if you can get lower part count, that would be a great addition. Yeah, and. Yeah. I think that I mean the clarity of our unique value proposition is the construction set. Nobody has a construction set. We claim to to have that. I mean we're not there fully yet, but from modifying to any kind of size of frame and so forth, um, we're aiming towards the construction set approach. Like with I mean the idea is to I mean we've already scaled it up to the one inch axes for the the CNC torch table, and I was actually looking a bit uh, as I was doing research for the book. We can get using um, 15 millimeter wide G2 belts, we can get up to 200 pounds of force on a heavy duty kind of a D3D based machine. So a machine which has two inch shafts, not 5 16th inch shafts, but two inch shafts. So that's the scaled up version. Um, still can be do, done with simple GT2 belts and get you 200 pounds of force. I'll, I'll show those. You can look at my book writing on, on, on uh, 
somewhere in my paper trail on my work log. Um, okay, Ruslan, you want to um, continue on the D3D workbench? The congratulations on what you have done so far. What what I, I'm pointing to there is some sample frames that I made. It's awesome. You can do from a based on a drop down. You can select all sizes of pipe and wait up to what like you have what like up to like six inch or how how fat it goes all the way from tiny little cubes to fat pvc pipes but it's really nice um you select both the corners and the pipes so you can mismatch them like as i did in this this example here at the center but yeah it looks looks awesome it feels great just to you know click and there you go you put in the dimensions and there you have your frame which would otherwise take you hours or an hour or something so I like five seconds better <laughs> Ruslan so yeah yeah it's it's great so congratulations on that um, uh, do you have some questions on the t-slot because so you're saying you know um, for T-slot, if you do a D3D based on T-slot, what you would have to do, if you want to use the axes, then it would be just be a simple, uh, you could be a 3D printed interface piece that that allows our current axes to mount into T-slot, like like a kind of like a little bracket or something bracket-like that attaches to T-slot, which is T-slot is the aluminum extrusions. And then you can connect our, our axes just as if it were any other frame. So basically it would have the holes where you can side uh, bolt it from the end or from the face into one of these mounts. Um, what are your specific questions that we want to... Can be modified. Yeah, um, okay, so I'm going to draw that for you. Yeah. Uh, okay. For, for, for me, it begins with uh, some aesthetical view or in a, uh, your looks. Uh -huh. Because uh, I, I like how the things, how the tools look. Uh, look. And for me, uh, to have a tool which looks nice is very important. Then I would like to work with it. And um, then. Um, it is portable, I think. At least if you once if you make made um, a PVC uh, frame, you cannot easily uh, put it apart, or you, you cannot actually put it apart. You you uh, send me uh, some link how I can uh, how one can disassemble PVC, but this is a rather destructive disassembly. Yeah, destructive of the pipe, but not of the corners. Yes. Uh, yes, and with, with uh, some special tools, and then you walk uh, with, uh, with, <laughs> with uh, it, uh, being the, in an apartment uh, uh, in a city, I, I cannot uh, do a lot of things. Uh, then, um, uh, yeah. I have also not so many tools. And, uh, for example, uh, what was the problem? The, the portability. Uh, if, if something is wrong with uh, with um, aluminium frame, I can just disassemble. Or if I need to transport uh, the printer, uh -huh. it's easy to, to disassemble um, and um, transport it uh, partially. Uh, uh -huh. Not completely. As a whole part. And the further advantage is uh, if, if there is a possibility to assemble, to disassemble, if we will offer someday a workshop, uh -huh. I think uh, it's easier to work with things which you can uh, fix easily. And uh, with PVC, once you did it uh, uh, wrong, wrong, then there is, an, there is no way to fix it. Huh. Just you know what? It sounds like you really like the T-slot idea. I like that. Okay. Um, yes. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a, that's all right. So look at um on page nine there. I agree, but there are a lot of advantages uh, yeah. in uh, PVC. Um, yeah. No, I. I, I think that the, t the the Universal Construction Access system lends itself to this with this little interface element. You see this this piece that I just drew up in uh, in green. You need to print one of those. It's just a piece that will mount into the T slot, and you can mount the axis into that with its existing two two side holes, two side bolts. So right now the bolts go through. The, this would otherwise be the PVC frame, but now you're gonna make this little. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So this piece can be 3D printed. That that's good. It can be 3D printed, and it would attach with a little one of those connectors into the T slots. The T slots with a T slot hardware. So that's actually pretty good. Um, now, so forty dollars for a full frame. Forty dollars for a full frame. Fifty. Okay. Uh, show a link for that. I'd like. I'd like to see that. Okay. Um, do you have a link? Because that's no. That's relatively decent. Okay. Uh, so let's see. So what you want to do? Let's see, where is your, I don't see it on your log. Um, in, in my log. Can you uh, paste the page? Uh, March 6th. March 6th. Ah, there. Eight thirty-two millimeter echoes. <laughs> All right, pipe, uh, one meter. <laughs> okay, okay, it's German. Let's see this. Uh, wait, so you've got? Oh, so you've got that. That's uh, oh, T. Sorry, T slot. I see. Um, aluminum T slot profile. Let's see, is that for real? Um, okay, what's the cost there? One meter costs... How much? 294, 2.94 euros. Uh, you, you can also order different sizes that you oh. cut them yourself. Oh wow, that's not bad at all for one meter. That's a dollar a foot. That's pretty good. And, wow. Uh, Oliver has uh, more experience huh. with this kind of, uh, uh, of profiles. Yeah. Well, that's that's actually not bad. I thought it was more expensive than that. I thought it was like double that I, I or think so. It's, uh, more expensive. Well, the the BOM that you have that looks, that's correct, right? That's that's available. Um, or no, or that's yes, just. It is available. Okay. Yeah, no, that's that's quite good. That's then that's that makes it quite a decent option. In fact, in fact, makes me think, huh? Maybe we offer both PVC and this for the workshop. That's interesting. All right. And advantages if people want to transport. Paper yeah. Into ah. Right, because people can actually, yeah. I mean, they would be able to build that 3D printer and not glue the corners yet in the workshop, so they can build it and disassemble it. But yeah, then they have to go back to gluing it. Just like here, though, I mean, it's not quick to get to do those little tiny screws into the T-slot. We did, the, you know, in 2016, uh, we did a T-slot version of the Folgertech Prusa i3. 
it takes quite a bit of time to do those little little uh, little screws so yeah but other than that that's that's pretty good so, uh, sorry say it again I have different prices than you I have double you have double I have uh, for me it's saying 2.94 euro per meter for me it's five Huh. It's not only because of taxes. Wow, that's interesting. Um, hmm. No, it turns out 19% tax and and something. It's it's racking up those costs. It's now tell me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, let's let's see what the actual bill looks like. So you have the links there. And let's see. Uh, after you... So this is before buying it, right? So after you buy it, you know, tell us, please fill in, like, the actual price that you paid. Yeah, maybe add a, add a column. Suggested price and real price <laughs> with shipping and things like that. I already uh, put shipping cost in this uh, in this list. Uh, how are you getting seventeen point five two euros then? Oh, is that what it comes out to? Uh, I order uh, twelve uh, yeah. shipping cost and shipping cost is thirty I see. Already cut. I see. Okay. Well, that's that's an excellent price. So yeah. So this is what you what you already uh, paid for. No, I didn't pay it. I am thinking. Okay. Uh, if I will do it or not, because, uh, maybe later there will be some uh, problems with this kind of constructions. Yeah. Uh, because we we need some kind of stability, and uh, maybe aluminium is not really good material for this, and with the time it will. Uh, less rigid construction well uh, all I can tell you is that it's not scalable like um, like the steel because the steel we can make any thickness we, we have full control over what thickness that steel is but for the small scale machine it looks like it will work but I can also tell you if you get much larger profiles they're going to be much more expensive, so probably not worthwhile for there. But just for the use case of a small machine, I think it would definitely make sense. But it's not highly scalable. That's that's the only disadvantage. But if you treat it as a construction set approach, where the T-slot frame is one of the modules that we use, then yes, that's okay. But it wouldn't serve for all our purposes, and especially not the high, heavier duty CNC. Uh, Oliver has, uh, has some kind of construction set, uh, universal construction. Yeah. Uh, yep. Fit for metric uh, dimensions. Uh huh. And uh, he has uh, uh, more experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, general rule is that the things become, uh, as the size gets larger, they get non linearly expensive in general. Um, uh, not, not only you. Talk about um, just a uh, couple of minutes ago. You mentioned about different um, possibilities how you can improve uh, the properties of a PVC frame by yeah. concrete and then enlarge it. But I think it's not that easy because uh, when you scale things which have weights, uh, you have a linear scale of, of size and have cubic scale of weights and then there are other physical properties which are scaled with uh, um, different rates that's true and, um, that's true and each you, you have things like torsion and um, yeah tangents uh, they also if, if you um, in construction uh, at least as far as I remember from uh, mechanic lessons uh, so, sometimes it's better to have not uh, um, beams which are not uh, 
uh, only from from solid um, metal or something like this. That means uh, it's sometimes better to have a pipe instead of cylinder because of some uh, properties, material properties. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it depends. It depends on the, yeah. There's there's a whole bunch of different considerations. Uh, that's part of the reason why um, finite element analysis within FreeCAD would be very useful because you can get some of this stuff out before you build it. In a CNC torch table, we used hollow pipe instead of okay. solid pipe for the x-axis for exactly the reason you said. It's lighter and therefore bends less. Even though it's weaker, it actually bends less because the, it's not getting bent so much by gravity. So yeah, there's different uh, different cases. It depends what you're doing. So if you have a very specific use case, there it might make sense in one. Like for the concrete filled PVC frames, there's going to be a limit to that. And then if, there's going to yeah. Well, the link to uh, four way uh, corners. Uh, you you mentioned that you want to make holes in the corners. Yeah. Concrete, but you, you can ah. just different uh, corners. I see. Not three ways, but four ways. Yeah, you could do that. That's a good point. Um, yeah, yeah. If you don't mind having that little corner there, yeah. That's good. Because if you do the corner within, um, if you destroy, you know, drill through a, a corner piece, you can put like a little plug in there to make it, you know, to plug it up to make it look good, you know. But yeah, what you said, that that's good. You could use that. And there is a possibility Another advantage of uh, having four-way corners, then you have some kind of little legs for yes, to, which, uh, exactly. The frames. You, you you know uh, if you have a table and you want to yes. make it uh, to fit the ground, then yep. uh, some tables have some kind of s screws. Yes, and you can a adjust. Exactly. Uh, or you can take the corners and point them up so that you can make another beam up there for a spool holder so there's yeah there's different uses yeah the the multiple corners more things you have yeah you could do different things with it if that's necessary yeah but yeah 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 that's um i mean i i don't know i mean try try the you can try the t-slot version that's I think a decent idea, uh, but then you'd have to make another uh, frame option within FreeCAD for T-slot. <laughs> yeah. Of course. I don't. Yeah. That would be your, that would be your punishment for doing a good job on a T-slot. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, so you're still debating which which way to go, yeah? Yeah, you do. Uh, but, a, you know, it's a hole. Yeah, it's a jig and a drill. I mean, a drill. You really want to have a drill for building one of these in a workshop because you can put in the screws much faster. So we can't really build effectively in a single day build without a drill. It just takes too much time to work all the screws. So it, the drill really helps it. So it's not not too much. It's a one one drill bit that you'd have to have. Now the other thing is you okay. because it's actually not not that simple because you probably will need more tools for the T slot because you're going to have the unique heads on the screws that you use in the T slots, and you probably will have two Allen wrenches for those screw heads. What so they? what's that? What are they? Yeah, those are those hexagonal Google Allen wrench. A L L E N. They're just uh, little wrenches. But typically the heads in a T slots, the screw heads 
are these hexagonal holes for hexagonal wrenches. So um, the reason, like, I don't really like working with the T-slot frame because it takes so much time to, and those screws are so tiny. I mean, you're not going to like how tiny those screws are. It's hard to handle them. Uh, in the D3D, we, we have six millimeter screws. In a T-slot like that, you might have three and four millimeter screws. They're tiny, just hard to handle. Um, but I mean, it's still worth, I mean, the, the good comparison, like side by side comparison of how much time it actually takes to build a frame out of the T-slot versus otherwise, that's still interesting to know. Cause you still have to cut the, say the PVC pipe, you know, so, so it might, it, you know, it might be that you end up doing it faster with the T-slots. I don't know, but I suspect it's probably not faster, even though you have to do the cutting of the PVC and stuff. If you have that proper jig, uh, I think it might be faster. You can pre-cut already. Right, you can pre-cut. Yeah, so that means, um, yeah. I mean, if you have everything pre-cut with a PVC, it would be, I can tell you, it'll probably be two or three times faster than the T-slot frame. Yeah. I mean, it just takes so, so much. Each corner has uh, six screws. So you're talking about six times eight. You got 48 screws just for the for the corners, and then you've got 24 of the little T-slot connectors, three on each corner. So you got right there. You've got 68. You know, over six. What is it? Uh, 48 plus 24. 72. You got 72 parts right there plus 12 T-slots. That's 84 parts right there compared to six parts. So you see how the time could add up. Yeah, and in fact, when I look at it, you'll probably end up spending three times as much on your frame, three, three times as much time, which means that if we do that in a workshop, we have to consider that and make sure that we can do that within a workshop. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it would be an interesting data point. Maybe we uh, can have different tools and different uh, tools and some of them are more for precision work. Right. Another are for uh, fast mass production. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's not guaranteed that you're going to be more precise with it. I mean, I, I'd like to see what, what the kind of results are. I mean, I'm not sure the T-slot will give you an advantage of any sort when you're, if you talk about precision, because the precision is not really in the frame. It's in the axes, so to say. Uh, it well no it is in the frame at least in some part it depends how accurate the frame is cut so if you your cuts on a frame are such that the the end result is very parallel as far as the sides that's the part that matters so for the PVC it would be how accurately are the PVC frame PVC pieces cut versus how accurate are the T-slot pieces cut so that will be but yeah, I mean, we should, I mean, that, that kind of data, that would be data collection for, like, we never really took formal data on, on, like, repeatability measurements and so forth on the actual motion of D3D. We, ne we never got to that. So that's part of the stuff that we can do. Like, okay, is it, you know, 20, you know 10 micron positioning accuracy? How parallel is it down? All these kinds of data points that we can, we can get. Yeah. Maybe there is a reason for them an extension that the part of a uh, Prussia printer uh, uh, there are a lot of parts and it's a complicated um, no no I, I I don't think part count has has uh, much to do with elegance of a machine I think the, the they have it but that means uh, there is a reason to do it yeah, but, okay, well, I mean, there's many reasons, especially from the business perspective. In business, sometimes you get an MVP that sucks. I'm not saying the Prusa sucks, but, I mean, they might have had a some kind of a constraint where that's what they could do with the time and resources they had. Uh, it doesn't mean that their frame is optimized or that just because it's the next iteration, it doesn't mean it's optimized. It might be so experimental that it's actually worse. So, okay, so it doesn't... 
not know the goals of optimization. And you don't know how, what they optimized for or if they optimized at all for, for what? You don't know unless you have a conversation with them. You don't know the parameters of their design or how much resource or how final it is or whatever. That's, that's part of uh, understanding a technology. Like, for example, when people see something on a, you know, something that's open source on a website somewhere, the fir they should have, the first thing is they should ask a lot of questions. Like, if it's not apparent from the data, from the documentation, like, okay, does this thing actually work? You know? And I can tell you from experience that a lot of people, just from looking at our stuff, think that we've built the entire GVCS already. Because they don't really look read anything, it's and it's all all over the place, and um, they they don't have an accurate assessment of the state of a certain technology. That's typically the case for a lot of a lot of projects. You have to really look down into do they you know can you see that in the files? Can you see get the actual bill of materials? There's a lot of detail to whether it actually works or is better or not in order to assess that. Um, yeah, I mean, Abe is saying we got to test the frames and rigidity. I mean, we are absolutely not proven yet anything on a PVC frame. It may not work. I'm sure we can make it work, but but that's, you know, we might build... We already built one, and it worked reasonably well, but we don't have any rigorous data on it, except that it seemed to print well. So this is this is data collection and, and actual real experimentation. So... Oh. Yeah, and if you want to get to one micron accuracy, I was just researching this, you get what's known as surface plate. It's a very, very precise piece of granite that's not one thousandth accuracy, like one thousandth of an inch, but a one millionth of an inch flat. And those are actually affordable. You can get surface plates for like a hundred bucks for like the slab of very flat granite rock. And that's what precision machines for like uh, clean room air bearings down to one micron accuracy. Uh, if you haven't seen this, I'm going to paste this link. Guys, take a look at this. Uh, Dan Gilbert, Gelbart. He has an open source lathe that's down to one micron. It's a grinder with air bearings. Um, so take a look at, I'm going to paste this very worthwhile. He's got an 18 part series on shop techniques for novices. So take a look at that. Dan Gelbart. He's the guy that made this open source. Well, it's a DIY. It's not particularly open source, but it's a DIY one micron precision lathe slash grinder made with the, the super precision granite surface plate. Uh, so do take a look at that. It's a page called Dan Gelbart. Uh, he is super skilled. This guy is a very, very highly skilled professional. Um, but that's the limit of, of what, what people can do. And we can get to the surface grinders and the grinding operations that do get us to the one micron accuracy. And we can do that with grinding. And I also believe we can do that with a D3D precision frame. Uh, D3D with the three millimeter rods that's th three millimeter three uh sorry two inch rods we can get to that kind of stuff that's that's kind of the limit the super limit of precision using grinding and the much heavier duty uh precision cnc axis the universal axis still okay uh so ruslan you you good to go can we move on yeah, yeah. and um uh, so you've done um do you have any time these days to continue peppering at the axis on the D3D workbench? Can you you think you can implement the axis? Yeah. What do you want to, uh, to have? Yeah, to select the to the simplified axis like John is working on, where the link is on the the simplified axis. The ability to select axis length, and basically, you know, with a click of the button, select the length, and it gets you that axis into the so we can do the full design within like for example if you got to model your 3d printer that you're going to build you can do that uh, by selecting the right axis length so that's the main thing did it make sense what i yeah is it really what we want to achieve or we if there are 
some uh, there are a couple of certain parameters, and uh, all the other parameters will derive automatically from them. For example, if you uh, fix the frame, then yeah. uh, the the axis will be. Uh, you can do that, but that's 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 faster. However, it's less versatile because you can mount the axes in different ways. You can mount it inside, outside. You can mount it um, like if you use PVC frame, you can you can do it on the face or on the edge. So you would have to accommodate for all those cases. But if you have the just, I mean, the simplest thing to do. For the most versatile is just to allow you to select a particular length and then you fit it to the whatever frame you have because it will be it will have to be different depending on what kind of frame you're using and whether you want to mount it on the inside or outside or edge of the frame there's different ways you can mount things so yeah that's I think that's a little too complicated for now what do you think okay. some kind of a similar interface like I did for the frame. Yeah. You just select the length and then you you will get the axis. Yeah. And the yeah. problem is if you will change the length, the length you will get another axis. You cannot just uh, change it um, dynamically. You will get uh, each time a, a, a uh -huh. object. Okay. Um, well, but the point is, when you click on an axis, yeah, you create a new object. You you uh, you create the one of the length that you want from scratch, just like you're building the frame from scratch. Does that make sense? I do it. I create each time new object and not uh, change the old one because I can't. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. That's that that would be perfectly fine. So, for example, if, if we, you know, we have a certain frame that we built up, we can put in a, an axis that we think is the right length. We can put it in there. If we see it needs to be a little different, we can generate a new one very quickly of the correct length. Or, we, I mean, no, the simplest thing is to measure. You first measure, right. You first measure and then you, you generate your axis. Yeah, that would be the workflow. Okay. What, what are they doing? Maybe I will uh, create right. some and not very ugly solution. Well, I mean, you can look at the the D three D CAD and you can see how the axes are mounted. You can take the official CAD. You can download it from. I mean, the D three D part library has a complete CAD. You can observe how they're mounted. Um, D three D part library. It does have a lot of different versions there. But there is, okay, the D3D 16-inch version, um, let's see, where is that CAD of the overall machine? Uh, I think it's in uh, D3D 16-inch version. Yeah, I mean, the best place to look at when you go to D3D 16-inch version goes to Part Index. Let's see, where is the final file? I mean, it tells you to go to D3D Integration. And in there, on D3D Integration, you have... Yeah, no, I see, this is all over the place. Oh man, we hardly have a link for the final CAD of the official 16-inch version on the... Okay. By the way, I would expect maybe not a couple of links spread all over the page at some point, but rather some kind of a book. Yeah. When you 
start, uh, for example, with the frame, then there is a short uh, explanation of what is frame for, what yeah. uh, properties should have really li like a book. Huh. Really? Well, that's called... No, nah, I'm just being uh, joking here. Yeah, that would be the design guide. We got to publish that as soon as we can. So, so I guarantee that we'll have that at least for the June workshop. But yeah, we got we to gotta get on top of that. Um, a design guide basically would tell you uh, how to... Really, before you go further on the, the D3D workbench, you should really have that design guide in front of you, which you don't. So... Um, the best we have so far. Let me see. Okay, could you please explain your sarcastic way of uh, speaking? Yeah, what I'm saying is, yeah, what I'm saying is that what you're calling out for is exactly what we need. We just haven't drawn that up okay. yet. A nice, tight. Uh, simply, this is the D3D design guide. If you want to design it, here's how it how you do that. How it goes together from the existing parts. Um, man, I can hardly find. I'll will make sure I'll send that PC. Emmanuel was working on a semi-complete version. Let me see. Where is that? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, take a look at the link in the chat box and that's a good one let's see I'm gonna open that up right now I cannot uh, use this link for some reason you can't oh no Okay, let's try that again. Maybe I have a problem with my browser. Um, let's see, is that coming through? No, some... No, oh man, I, I, why is it I doing that? that? But when I did, I uh, land on the page of the title. Somehow... Right. Um, um okay can you see my screen, I can see screen. yeah that's oh, actually the file uh let's see it's not see but it's it's not even complete that's why i'm saying we we got a little bit more work to do we got to complete this cad sometime um that's, that's a, uh, reading, uh, through email. yeah yeah but as you see here you mount the okay. axis pieces. Can you show your screen? Oh. Yeah. Right. So this is the geometry uh, where the axis pieces are mounted on the inside of the steel frame. Now here they're mounted on the face side. But you can mount them one of two ways. You can do it through these end, wall, end holes because there's nut catchers in them. Or you can do it through one of the four holes on the face. So there's different ways you can mount it. And then uh, uh -huh. the x-axis goes in between. But the basic geometry is like this. And now we've moved. Man, we're just iterating too much. But the official version now has two z-axis. Two z-axes. Uh -huh. But you can see they can go on the inside of the frame. It could go on the outside of the frame. And here, uh, these are called the y-axis, what I'm showing. That can be mounted to the inside of the frame, or to the outside of the frame, or through these, through this side where you see these two holes. So there's a lot of different variations you can do depending on what frame size you have and how much range of motion you want exactly. Um, the axis size will determine how much of the bed you will cover. So the most important thing we do out of the CAD is look at, okay, now we've got these axes where exactly is the range of motion on a bed because that will determine where the bed has to be mounted and how much of it you'll be able to use. Okay. And as you see here, basically we're hitting against the end stop here on, the, on this side 
Therefore, the range of motion is only between right there and there, between these two points. That's your entire range of motion. Um, and that, just by visually inspecting that, that's actually a little smaller than, looks a little smaller than the actual bed. So we know that this design here is not taking advantage of the full bed. Um, so that's why you want to do the detailed design. You want to figure out exactly how much frame you need and you want to make sure that you're covering the entire bed. And that's just the 8 inch bed. This would nowhere near cover the 12 inch bed. So that's why in some of the versions we put the axes on the outside to extend the range of motion and the size of, that the head can travel. So uh, you also have a, I see an advantage here with this construction. You can um, just, uh, wait, I for a word. um, hole enclosure, you, you can... Yeah, that's oh. correct. You can oh, enclose it, but then again, Stephen has shown that he's he has enclosed the PVC frame, too. He just put... Uh, I saw it. Yeah, I saw it. he put covers on the sides as well, so... So, but this is the best because there is no space. Like if you want to just completely close it, there's a airtight seal you can make right there. So that's uh -huh. that's pretty good. Yes. Yeah. That's what I meant. Yep. An yep. advantage of this kind of construction. Yep. Uh, which is not as good in a T slot either. This is the best. I mean, I'm telling you, this simple kind of frame is the most universal it's for power cubes it can be used for heavy duty things um, it's very very flexible and you know what else but you need, uh, you need special tools to construct this kind of frame uh, you need uh, depends well, depends I mean you can epoxy the frame together we have epoxied it and you need you do need the holes through the metal but that's CNC cut so if you have the entire frame CNC cut that's the easiest and fastest but then again, then you need to get the CNC cutting. So it, it depends. I mean, it depends what the goals are. The, there's what what needs to happen is you can you can do a chart comparing advantages and disadvantages of each method in detail, and we can make choices. But I mean, in general, for like the super the here, I think we're looking here at the most flexible. I think that this is the most most universal. Um, now the other thing is it's hard to CNC cut this stuff. It's you know you do it at a CNC shop or with your own CNC cutter, torch table. But there's another way you can do that. You can take flat strips and weld four strips to make one side. So, I don't think I can weld in my little apartment. Right. So that's prohibitive if you if you have an apartment. But if you're not in an apartment, um, you can. For the apartment, the easiest is your T-slot or PVC. Yes. Yeah. Unless you go to a hacker space where they might have a welder or or other things. I don't think they have. Yeah, but a welder costs. You can get a welder that can do this for a hundred dollars. So it's not, you know, it's not even like one of these tiny. Uh, you can get a 15 amp, 120 volt, volt MIG wire welder for like a hundred bucks from Harbor Freight. So the tools are not too bad either. Um, if one had to, you know, you know, say you want to start a business making these, well, you can start with a hundred dollar welder. And then once you make millions, you can invest in a water jet cutter. If I will really be able to do millions of these things, then I think um, I will have another problems. Uh huh. Well, that means you could be just doing all kinds of these things. Okay, uh, let's move on. We got to move on in a meeting. Let's. Uh, is that is that good enough for now? Yes. Uh, I j just want to mention to what is my state with uh, piping. Uh, yeah. Warping. Okay. Uh, I, I try to collaborate with the author of uh, Flamingo Workbench. Yes. I have some um, exchange messages, and I think, I hope uh, it will, will, will work uh, together. Okay. And then we can, uh, can use uh, some code for, from his workbench. 
Does it look positive? He's willing to collaborate? Uh, yes, I have put a link uh, to the discussion. And uh, I, first I would uh, try to, uh, to implement some, um, some parts using his uh, library and then uh, look if, if it will possible, for example, to use uh, his um, uh, placement and rotation tools. And uh -huh. then uh, another big, uh, big advantage uh, using uh, this uh, approach, for example, now you, you cannot change uh, parameters of uh, fittings. Uh -huh. uh, you create each time new things. But uh, with other approach, uh, you can really change uh, parameters of, of the fittings. For example, you can change the length of, uh, of the pipe. And, uh, uh, yeah. I want also to. Um, now, can you send a link to that workbench? Is that? I mean, you, so you're saying it works pretty well. That's it's in use. Look on the slide, page ten. Ah. Yeah. Really Excellent. Well, very good. So, how functional is the Flamingo workbench at present? How good is that? Uh, I didn't work uh, a lot uh, with it, but uh, I like it. Uh, send the uh, link to the download. Uh, send a link to it. Put it in the chat box or in, in the, on page 10. That'll be nice. That's very useful for us because that's something. Nice. Frames and pipelines mainly. If it simplifies frames, can we do our frame in there already? Like a metal frame? Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to take a look at that. And the instructions. So there's Flamingo. Do they have instructions to install the workbench? Yeah. Okay. Let's see if I understand this here. So. To install the workbench, use the FreeCAD add-ons installer. Copy the files of this repo to the subfolder of mod. I think you can use also GitHub. To... So, so call it Flamingo and just so so into mod. I mean, see, this is not clear for someone who doesn't understand this. What do you do? Can you, can you, uh, what's the simplest way to install it? Can you write a specific command? Because you did well on that. I mean, yeah. I mean, this is not, not writing for a novice. We want to make it novice friendly. Um, 
Can you do a git git clone on this repo? I, I think and that's yes. it. Okay. Uh, can you? Uh, Right. Okay. Wait. Uh, in FreeCAD uh, 0 0.70, there is already this uh, Atoms installer. Um. Okay. Where do I get to the add-on installer? FreeCAD add-ons. How do I access that within FreeCAD? I think uh, if you go to tools, menu, tools. the main menu, tools. Add-on manager? Add-on manager. Okay. And then you, you will see uh, Flamingo there. Make sure you know what are, you are installing, it says. Oh, great. Excellent, excellent. So they're automating all these installs. That's excellent. Okay, there's Flamingo. So, so install update. Downloading. It says it's downloading. But I don't see any evidence of that. You think it's working for me, or? I think it's working. Uh, the user interface is uh, maybe uh, not. Uh, How long not should it take to download? That should take a little bit of time. It says it's downloading, so maybe maybe it's working. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh. It says successfully installed. Let's see if that's true. Okay, that sounds good. So, so that's that's great. Um, and so, would you put your your piping macros and workbench into Flamingo, or would you put Flamingo uh, into because yours? I will uh, try to use them parallel. That means, for example, if you uh, if you remember, if you take an elbow of a pipe. And any other fittings, then there is a checkbox which uh, you can um, check if you want to have a solid or if it is uh, should uh, be from multiple parts. Do, do you know what I mean? Uh, so it's, you're saying installing Flamingo will add functionality to your workbench? Uh, something like, like this. Okay. Now we but you have a great solid checkbox, and then I will want to have another checkbox, uh, Flamingo. Okay. And then uh, it will use uh, Flamingo library to, to create parts which are compatible with them, but uh, okay. I didn't test it. Okay. The pipes, I will use di directly pipes from Flamingo. Okay. Can ch change them. Yeah, well, but, it works. Like, like you do with, uh, with cylinder parts. Okay. And the best documentation, what Flamingo, how to actually use it, uh, is that on a FreeCAD wiki? Uh, yes, I even saw some PDF files. Okay. Let's see, in Flamingo, examples, tutorials, yes. Oh, nice, okay. Okay, so we got it on, so let's see if Flamingo comes up on the FreeCAD wiki. Okay. Yeah, it has some documentation there. Good. 
That's great. Okay. Okay, we'll have to study that up. I mean, it sounds like it's f useful. Can it do things like pipes that are curved in different, like curve at yes. one angle and then another angle? I think yes. Wow. Just if, Okay, well that would be a solution for some of our hose riding, w routing and and electrical wire routing. Like for example in our in our files for the Lyman filament extruder, we can add maybe better wires or something like that or to the tractor and to the 3D printer. That's that's important, yeah. Let's study up on Flamingo and see if we can get that. Okay. Very nice. Uh, your priority right now is to, you, you're working on several things. What's your priority at this point? Uh, integration of Flamingo to perform some experiments. So okay. If, if, it's, uh, if I can, uh, my first idea is uh, to use the pipe and key slot. Yep. Only two things. And then try to make something simple like a frame using uh, placement and rotation tools from Flamingo. And if it works well, then I will add uh, other things. Aha, uh -huh. so, so does Flamingo already have T-slot or are you going to have to generate that? No, I will generate it myself. Okay. But I will use uh, their um, libraries. Okay. And if, if it will not work, I will, um, I will create something uh, very similar. But uh, with the main difference that you can change parameters of, of, uh, of the parts. Yeah. And yeah, excellent. Okay. Um, excellent. Keep going. Uh, Wiki's working for me, it looks like, no? Yeah, it's working for me, it might be, might be Abe's. Um, okay, let's move on to, to Abe. Okay, so we can hear me. Yes, we can. I think I'm, oh, I see the Wiki's back up now. Okay. Uh, 
Wait, uh, hold, on, hold on for a uh, second, Abe. Uh, I want to download the file you're looking at. That's powercube1711.fcstd? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Keep yeah, going. Let's see. I did the, um, let's see, the fill cap, which, if I understand, it, it's a one and a half inch, it's all, everything is NPT, set of pipe. Yeah, sure. Um, I designed that with, um, uh, I think we talked about it, one and a half inch. Yeah. With a two inch piece kind of spot welded over that. But then I assume there's a threaded cap, or the two inch part needs to be threaded because the cap needs to thread over that, right? So. Yeah, we don't really want to, I'm not sure we want to thread it. You, you can just put it on loosely, just a cap that has oh. an air gap, like, because it wants to breathe. Okay. You want to well, thread I, it on so it doesn't breathe. What I did was I made, th I guess I made it in three parts because I thought we talked about a, I guess I made a one and a half inch pipe that goes in a two and a half, or a two inch pipe section, and I thought that that left a gap and then you just spot welded those. And then I guess what I have is a cap on top of the two inch section. Uh, well, if you have so one and a half, I think uh, one and a half inch. Yeah. If you can just put it on there loose, then yeah. uh, whatever is fine. Um, They'll be fine. Doesn't be that complicated, maybe. Um, uh, yeah, I was kind of thinking, um, does this tank uh, need to be filled three quarters full? Pretty much, uh, yeah, three quarters. Okay, and yeah, I was trying to think what the um, leak point might be if it's on a hill tipping. As well. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. Tipped, would, uh, that, that would be the only it would have to be a lot of fluid in there for it to leak out through the... Yeah, uh, that'll be fine for what yeah. you have. Yeah. So how are you doing? Um, how are you doing the hoses? It's just you taking one plane and drawing a, a tube in one plane. Um, all I did was draw a sweep. Uh huh. Just one sweep and I rotated it. Now it looks somehow when I drew that sweep, I cut it off the uh, one dimension. I didn't even do that on purpose, but it's uh -huh. rotated in one axis. But um, yeah, it's. I did get more detailed on that, but uh, but it looks, yeah, I was trying to figure which way to orient some of those. And of course, these ball valves they can be cut off, but they, since they thread on, they probably is a need to thread those on in different different uh, arrangements, and they can be rotated. Uh, that's kind of hard to determine without not exactly. Oh, wow, well, yeah. So, uh-huh. Uh, Uh huh. I've still got to get. Uh, I've got to put fittings on the oh, pump wow. and verify the fittings on the on the cooler, and maybe I'll add some hose. Maybe I can draw actual hose pieces in there. We'll see how hard that is. Uh, Do you want the I guess I the two fittings to be pointing down? The two hoses to be down? They probably want to go up, right? Or no? Is there, um, what was your rationale? Cubes, right? Oh, okay, yes. Most of the hose can just go down. Okay, but, right. Of course, I guess it depends on where it fits on the cubes and what the best way is to route those hoses. I'm not, that's, that is kind of hard to figure. Um, so let's see, those aren't a quick disconnect because those are, well, those are the touch screens, so, well, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, and you got the rubber feet on too? Yeah, I put some spacers under the engine. Is yep. Bolts in there, yeah. Uh, and then, let's see, let me check the plumbing on the cooler. It's got a color code, kind of the plumbing, but I, I need to rethink some of that, but it's ready to do it. Uh, 
Right, and one suction goes to one to the pump here, so you, one of the five is the pump on this on this very yeah, power cube. The one, the one that I turned up, I kind of figured that that one was actually the hard one. I was trying to figure out how to route. Oh it yeah. How it, because that's actually kind of a harder radius, or it'll be a little bit longer. Somehow it might need to go up and around it. That's, huh. I don't know. Oh, what if we turn? Okay, you got a good point there. What if we just put the pump, twist the pump 90 degrees? Oh, yeah. And then yeah, it will be at the yeah. top. Wait, but no. But then the um, outlet oh, will be on the bottom. Yeah, that... Let's see. Yeah, that's kind of troublesome. Um, oh, you know what you can do? You can t take the one that's on a... If you're looking from above, the one that's on the right-hand side, and turn it around to the other, like uh, basically loops around to the other side of the pump. That would be, a, I think, an acceptable way. Yeah, could be one of the farther ones. Yeah, take the farther and you can wrap it around the other side of the pump and make a, like a circle almost. Yeah, because we got to work with that six-inch bend radius or so, like you're saying. Six inches is about right. Uh, it might, yeah. I mean, that six inches is comfortable. It might be, you know, it might be as low as five or four, but um, if you really force it. Yeah, and I suppose, well, uh, you probably don't want to put a ninety on anything, right? The, uh, no. Try to avoid it. Height. Uh, try to avoid it on a power line, but on the, you know, on a suction line, it's not too bad because those hoses are pretty wide. But on a power line, you're, I wouldn't do it on a power line. So the in, no, the inlet could, I, we could possibly do a a, a ninety. Uh, if, but a ninety might. You know, it could still be pretty difficult with a 90 still. Yeah, um, we have to kind of play with it. Uh, let's see. Just to problem solve that one. No, probably a, a 90 going above the pump. But see, you don't want to go above the pump. You want to go from below the pump because you don't want the suction. You want to loop above the pump because that could be a place for air to get trapped. Uh, you want to go s s as straight into, yeah, like, so possibly, like, from the far ones and a 90 straight into the pump, maybe. That will be one way to go. Yeah, no, these are these are important details because this is, like, you, you try to build it and you find, oh, it can't can't get it in. So, yeah, this is good. We're working that out here. Yeah, so possibly um, if you look from the top, the leftmost entrance and a 90 from it straight into the suction of the pump. Uh, but you have the suction on the other side, so flip the pump a 180. Uh, twist the pump 180. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that looks pretty good. Yeah, speak louder a little bit. There you go. It sounds like a lot of stuff is. Um, uh, the, I don't have the uh, uh, equipment for threading pipe, right, in the shop. You've got yeah. To buy all the nipples and yeah. all that, and then cut them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the easiest thing is to use yeah, simple pipes, yeah, cut them and weld them in. 
I mean... Yeah. Like plumbing in the tank wall, so and on those ball valves. Uh, yeah. So let's see. Yeah, plumbing. Is there something else on this filter? Yeah. Filter, you got it going in, and then. Uh, right, that'll be the return. Yeah. Let's see for the return filter. Right, so you got like three quarter inch. Are those um, let's see, those are the return lines, which are all. Oh yeah, so those are going to be quick connects there, right? Okay, so the the logic is you got a pipe with a quick, quick coupler on it, female quick coupler. returns the case returns everything uh, you, uh, yeah you, okay everything so well case returns are a quarter inch and the returns mm -hmm. normal returns are a half inch and they should all get yeah. female quick couplers which are standard parts okay yeah i saw that on the quarter inch i was going to add a coupler in oh and what you, i uh, see I so what you drew there are I see for the quarter inch you got like regular nips, but for the half inch you got the hex, hex nips? Um, yeah, those were parts that I grabbed from the uh, existing hydraulic uh, fitting library, I guess. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. There, there's some type of in the art. It was, uh, or, uh, I bought those in from my master car. I, can't remember. I think they were in the yeah. hydraulic um, already. So those are those definitely work uh the lower brow version is to take a piece of pipe and just weld it in because otherwise well you get one of these hex couplers then you just use one of them otherwise you can use a half inch pipe that you just cut in half and it's even lower cost like one of these hex couplers it's probably like a couple of bucks three bucks Whereas one pipe, one you get into two pieces and it's more like a dollar. So it's more like 50 cents versus two or three bucks per. Okay. Because so th that's not high pressure, that's low pressure. We don't need high quality stuff there. Yeah. Okay, so like a half inch threaded MBT just like, like everything else. Yeah. Uh, the well, on there. yeah, threaded. So these ones, the the qu the quarter inch ones, they also are threaded because they accept. Yeah, you don't have to draw the threads in, but yeah, they would be threaded in 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 practice yeah. to accept the female yeah, I mean, quick couplers. I've been just making those simple cylinders, but they are sized for for the MPT. I went back and tried to draw everything to the actual MPT sizes without just just no threads, obviously, and. Uh, Try to get that stuff more accurate. Um, it's like we're milling any of that parts yet, but it's of course th those tubes aren't tapered like the uh, that hex part that's drawn in there. Somebody drew that with the actual taper and everything, but um, just remember. Yeah, the hex ones are good but, for high pressure side, but we just don't need that kind of quality for the the returns. Okay. Yeah. But like the hex would be on the on the outlet of the pump, because that's that's the pressure outlet of the pump. That should have a, yeah. But the fitting on a pump, I think, is SAE, so that's a little different fitting. Yeah, and there's some parts adapted there. I'll, I'm gonna double check what was on there before. Mm-hmm. Uh, fittings, I think it. Well. I guess it oh, okay. Uh, let me tell you about the inside. Uh, so let's strip the end. If you look at my screen. Okay. Oh wow. 
So here's one detail we didn't talk about, and that is when you have the hydraulic fluid shooting out into the tank, what we did was weld an elbow and a pipe going below the surface of the water to minimize bubbling and frothing. Because here you have the hydraulic fluid splashing into the wall. You want to turn it down and below the, the liquid level so it doesn't splash and get air bubbles okay. trapped. Yeah, I think I strained some of those pipes just to the inside of the wall. I figured they could stick there and be welded in whichever way is easiest to weld. But it sounds like, well, I guess you would weld the ah, so through there first, and then you're talking about welding a large elbow on the inside as well. Yeah, let me show you a picture of that, because we've got some pictures from the workshop. So I should have a power cube album, or a workshop, the tractor workshop, um, the micro track. Those will be needed on all the returns. Yeah. Except for the case drains, which are very slow, which don't need that. Okay, let me pick out this. Yeah, let me see if I can find that. Get you a picture of the inside of the tank. Yeah, I made a note to take a picture of the, ah, here we go. Um, do you see my screen? This is the picture you want. Okay, I think I see what you're referring to. Yeah, we have a, so we welded in a pipe, we put an elbow in there so we can thread into the elbow and then these two other pipes and they go below the fluid line. So that's, that's what the, in the making is. I'll do a, okay. The elbow is welded in, and then you thread the other pipe through the wall. Exactly. Wall into the elbow. Okay, right. So weld on the inside. Okay. Okay. That's yeah, you will, this is inside the tank before it's closed up. So we weld the entire inside in. And there we have two returns. In your case, we have more. Yeah, okay, so I may have to edit the whole size so and I'll figure out which. I'm going to post that to my Facebook here. Okay, so I guess Power that cube. Means these, uh, um, the parts that stick through. Yeah, okay, so the actual return components like I have in there, they can actually be short, double, and threaded nipples, uh, so they'll thread through into the, uh, into the L. Right, yeah, yep. So then that would just be a stock part. Okay, I'll figure out what the length of. some regular pattern on all the fittings there, but there's possibly more room to spread those out more if they're going to get in the way. But I think those quick couplers are pretty easy to uh, work with as long as you can get your hand around them, right? Just That's right. Off. Yeah, they're easy. Yeah. Yeah, let me paste that into the working dock.
so let's see this um, sharing options share no that's not even share okay it's shared now um, see if you can click on that link that I just posted on slide 12 can you see the Google Drive Four oh four. Let's see what's going on. Just shared it. Let me see photos. Google. Try that again. Oh, Google four oh four. That's an error. I don't know what's doing. I mean, it's getting into my computer. Um. Let's see. Is there something wrong with the URL? Sharing options. It says it's shared. Yeah, it's probably uh, it's probably a Google issue because I'm trying to sh should be public. Okay. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, th you got that one picture there. That's what we got there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So yeah, it's a pretty yeah. You put some pretty long pipes on there to make sure. It's yeah, make sure it goes below. But not all the way to the bottom, so you're stirring up dirt at the bottom if there's dirt down there, if there's like metal filings, so th maybe like three inches off the off the bottom. Okay. Yeah, I got, it's more like four inches off the bottom, yeah. Okay. Four inches. So this go straight down. Yeah, four inches. Yeah, that's for welding. Yeah. Okay. That's all prior to weld. But yeah, I mean that route is pretty easy to do. You just lay it all up. It, it's all self-aligning because all the lengths are correct, and that's a that's a pretty decent way to make it. We thought, I mean, we started with angle irons for the frame, and I can tell you that's just not as easy as this. We build up the iron angles from two flats, effectively. We should be able to do that ourselves too, right? Um, let's see, is that documented?
think, so what, there should be a, um, I'm trying to think what wiki page, um, there is for, for, um, starting projects, if that, that might need to be listed, because, yeah, it should be, it should be. Early, that way all the information gets in, because otherwise it, it, it won't really generate much of anything, because it's, it relies on the change in well, I mean, you want to get it up as soon as you can because then it will call that, like it will start logging it, whatever the data in a spreadsheet is. Like if it's already burned down quite a bit, you can only catch it at that place. Um, yeah. So, but you should still do it. I mean, we got to start yeah. using more burn downs. I think that's a good good thing to do. Yeah, I was trying to think what wiki page... Um, for starting new projects. Uh, <laughs> I'm like starting that right now, right. starting projects. Oh, I see. Okay, good. Create a work log yeah. is number one. Embed a simple development template. Create a burn down. So I guess I have some work to do uh, on the plumbing in that tank wall there for the return. And see, other than that, uh, there's some other little plumbing stuff to look at. But I guess the next thing that might alter the plumbing is just consideration of how this is going to fit on the uh, life track, which I haven't really gotten back to thinking about that much because that. I don't know, I guess the life track is still kind of flux on the design, even though uh, it seemed like we got to a good place on that design. Yeah, design is pretty decent. I mean, the only thing I would change about the life track is the loader arms. I mean, you can see that they're going to not be solid enough. Um, but I think the back there where we're... Yeah, no, I haven't looked at it in some time, but yeah, it might need some work. Yeah. See, but, you know, I was thinking... How do we test it? And we can do something like, I mean, we can do little scale 3D printed models, for one, if we have 3D yeah. printers. Or the small laser cutter, yeah. cutting out flats and bending them up into, gluing them into a 3D model. Um, yeah, and the, 
Actually, you know, yeah. it would be interesting. Is there a way to simulate, like, what if we 3D printed the power cubes and actually, like, fitted, like, actually use, like, wires or little tubes? Oh, man, that would be interesting. What we could do is uh, make the actual holes for all the fittings and, and uh, that so we can use wires, just, like, you know, gauge 14 wire to connect parts as they should be in real life to test out the actual practicality of connections in a, in a 3D printed model. That would be interesting. Because uh, yeah. plumbing, plumbing, plum, plumbing modeling, that would be useful. Yeah. Definitely would be. Yeah, wire or like um, something, 3D print, rubber 3D printed filament, yeah. something like that. Okay, so you got a little bit on, um, like for example, the the fittings are, or the connections are not drawn yet for the uh, cooler. Which yeah, the there's suction. There's another, I guess that we're on that CAD from before, and I'll see what. Yeah, I mean you have to to be you know Abe to be certain about what you need there is you have to look at the, the actual uh, purchasing link for the cooler and find out exactly what fittings it has so there's no amb ambiguity what's supposed to be on the end of it, right? Because the yeah. BOM is complete, right? It's pretty complete. Yeah, well, it's yeah, more or less complete. It's got enough parts in there that we know. Um, like, for example, what exactly, like out of the filter element, you know, what exactly is that fitting there? That if we, it, it can be a placeholder, but the, but it's, you know, for example, in a tree view, that should be labeled property. Like we should, we should be able to pretty much take the tree view and generate a whole BOM and that actually would be a good exercise for like the next step um, generating BOMs via the tree view so so I would say like this CAD file is absolutely complete when we can simply export the tree view for a BOM parts list and we could and I think there's some BOM there's some limited BOM functionality like that but we, we should explore that later um, for how to, because yeah. because otherwise we're gonna have to go through this whole thing and and start counting parts. It's a pain. So we should we should get that automated somehow. We should think about that for later. Yeah, it requires a lot of detailed metadata. I was thinking that the tree view is the best with the constraints yeah. and everything. I need to organize that in folders more. Yep. Uh, some, some process of work, but yeah, there's a lot of metadata to enter more on that that would help. Uh, you know, get it more. Yeah. Up. Um, yeah, I mean, we could uh, even get rid of the constraints once the file is finalized, so the, so the tree view looks very clean. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah I, I we'll work on that I think later. Constraints or putting more of these parts in different folders. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely, that would be. Changes a lot, and it that it it all gets a little bit confusing when you edit it. So, I had a lot of problems with the constraints kind of jumping around, but they, they kind of worked themselves out finally on the plumbing fittings, getting those all constrained. It all seemed to, once I went back and deleted stuff and reconstrained it, it, it worked out a lot better for some reason. Yeah. But sometimes it, so I, I'm not sure why, it just happened, so. Yep. All right, well, that's that's looking pretty good. So, so yeah, so maybe wrap up a little bit more of the fittings and see if we can draw any more of the plumbing um how close to a big city are you um well right now i'm pretty far up uh north arkansas usually occasionally i go to town near little rock but uh, how many hours uh what's well i guess i'm a couple hours from little rock right it's but um is Little Rock one million people or no? Um, 
No, I think it's uh, some fraction of that, a few hundred thousand, or I don't even think it's a half million. Oh wow, two hundred thousand. That's. And of course, there's there's Fayetteville is pretty big, maybe not too far, but I don't usually go over towards Fayetteville anymore. It's uh, west. How far are you from like? A million city like Oklahoma City. Um, Memphis. Looks like Memphis or Oklahoma City. You're in like north, what city are you in? What town? North Arkansas. Uh, it's near Tilly. Actually, it's uh, Orwood Springs, which is uh, Clinton, I see there on your screen. Uh, Near Harrison. Harrison is probably the largest town. It's near Bethany. But I don't know. Uh, Wood Springs, not Wood Springs. Um, Tilly, Arkansas. T I L L Y is closest, actually. But it's just a just a post office. <laughs> Tilly was right on, on the Ozark National Forest there. So it looks like you're Close. closest to Memphis? Yeah, yeah, that probably is. Close to big city, maybe more so than Oklahoma. Yeah, that's... Three hours, 45 minutes. I'm thinking, you know, like once we get the whole prototyping kit done, I'm thinking of taking uh, taking a show on a road for design sprints where we could run a workshop in a big city and then have it like a few day event. And then the second day is we'd be, be actually prototyping stuff like in the scale models and, and design FreeCAD and then actual 3D printing as well as laser cutting with a little tiny laser cutter. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about that. That might be a good way to get the community engagement going. Like, so in a, any big city, there will probably be a few people that show up. Yeah. Yeah, a large enough area. Um. Yeah. Anyway, for later. Okay. Um, are we good for now? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, we covered everything. I'm a power cube, so yeah, more the plumbing and terminal on the tank and. Close. Yeah, we're uh, we're getting pretty close to actual reality here. That's good. Yep. All right. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. So uh, I guess um, we'll call it a day here. Let's see. Any other questions, comments here? Do we cover everything? We did not really oh. take notes too much, but uh, actually, I noticed that earlier. I didn't see. I realized there was nobody taking notes. I don't yeah, see. nobody took notes. Too bad. Make sure we remem remember next time. Um, yeah, you a page for that. Right. I should have. What I'll do is I'll read through the entire agenda at the beginning of the meeting so we make sure we don't forget the net note taker. Okay. All right. Well, great, Abe. So we'll uh, continue. So until next week, and uh, I'll be at the Midwest Rep Rap Festival this weekend. See what comes up from that. See if we find some collaborators. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, good meeting. Yep. Take care then. Good meeting. Bye bye.